you will, look with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 22. I want to read for us from verse 6 down to verse 21 to uh, wrap up our study in this book. For those of you that have endured with me from the beginning here in Shreveport, you may have noted that uh, by coming to the end of chapter 22, I will have uh, finished preaching through all of the books of the New Testament from Matthew through to Revelation. It's taken 13 years, but <laughs> And uh, probably need to go back and review a lot of that preaching myself. Uh, I trust that you have grown during this time as I have, and I uh, truly appreciate your prayers each time. It's, it's a serious matter to stand up here and open this book and to declare the glories of Christ. I've been prayerfully weighing where to go from here, not to retracing the steps and starting with Matthew wouldn't be a good idea, but there's still a number of books in the Old Testament that we have yet to consider. And so I trust by God's grace next time to begin preaching through the prophets. We'll start with Isaiah and just see how the Lord directs. You're going to have to give me long life if we're going to get through all of the, all the books of the Old Testament before I I'm taken out of this world, but uh, we'll just take it a, a step at a time. Here in Revelation 22, in verse 6, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. And we read the words that this angel or messenger communicated to John. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things, or the messenger. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Another way of putting that, he that is unjustified, let him be unjustified still. Because there's only one way a sinner could ever be justified, and that's through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from that, you will be unjustified still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous or justified, let him be justified still. That's a precious comfort to know that if Christ shed his blood for me, nothing's going to take away what he accomplished. Let him be righteous still. I'm no different than those that the Lord condemns, but by that righteousness imputed, I am righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. There's not any degrees to holiness. I'm not growing in holiness. If Christ put away my sin, I'm as holy as God himself because that's the way God accounts those for whom Christ died. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. 
Those are strong words, but they all describe people in false religion. Those are terms that throughout scripture are used to describe false religion. Christ even said of the Pharisees, you are murderers from the beginning, liars, adulterers, sorcerers, idolaters. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life. Notice, freely. It's the only way it's given. It won't be conditioned on the works. It's freely. Freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now in these closing verses, there is really little that requires special comment. <laughs> it's almost like a ship that's been brought through the rough seas and now the shore is right there and it's heading into harbor. As we've come through this book of Revelation, we've seen a lot of strange symbols and things that describe how God is pleased to work in his world. And we may have puzzled some over those symbols and had to go back and study and search and try to understand how these things pertain to Christ's glory. And it's much like, I suppose, a, a math book or some other book that you study. They, some parts are easy to understand. Two plus two equals four. But when you get into, you know, other aspects of it, it requires your full attention. It's all based on the same principle or truth, formulas and theorems. But nonetheless requires a hard study and look in these things regardless of what our ignorance may be as to what all these symbols mean we know it all pertains to Christ we, all, we know it all pertains to his glory and to me that's what's so refreshing now coming to the final chapter here we see even as this book began the revelation of Jesus Christ how does it end the revelation of Jesus Christ so that's simple language, simple statements, lest there be any doubt in anyone's mind as to the importance of all that is revealed in the word pertaining to Christ. And I believe there are several reasons given to us here as to why God's word is important. And I hope that the more we study it, the more we want to study, the more we want to learn and read not just depending upon what I tell you, but in your own private lives, sit down and open this book and read it. And may the Spirit of God ever point us to Christ. But verse 6 here in Revelation 22 gives us one of the primary reasons why God's Word is important. Very simply put, it he said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. We've all been disappointed by men. We've studied men and their commentaries and then bumped along on to learn that they, they deviated from the, the gospel and the truth. These are disappointments in our life. But concerning the word of God, it'll never disappoint. These sayings are faithful and true, inspired of God through the agency of men and angels 
lot of times we talk about God's inspired word being given through men, but what we're reading here concerning Christ was communicated through an angel to John. And angels have brought throughout scripture the word of God to the Lord's people. They've been given charge for the strengthening and encouraging of God's elect. And what I see is that all of it is to the honor and glory of Christ. Never, ever have to fear trusting God's word. And I would encourage you to constantly weigh every thought, every interpretation, even as I have to do in light of what God has said. What he said is far more important as men's commentaries. And the best commentary on scripture is scripture itself. In fact, I find right here in this portion of scripture, a very clear warning to all of us, never to fall prey to exalting the servant above the word, because the word is Christ himself. And even John here, as we read, when he heard these things, was so overwhelmed, he fell down, it says, before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. We all cherish instruments. <laughs> That's just our nature to do. If we think back of how maybe we first heard the gospel, perhaps from a man who's no longer preaching. He's fallen away. But the seedlings of the truth were communicated. And the Lord used that to draw you to Christ, and yet that one may now not even have anything to do with the gospel. This is just how God sovereignly works. If we ever have a notion that my salvation depends upon the man, then we fall into the same trap as those who hold apostolic traditions and, and uh, successions. Can you imagine if your salvation depended upon the man who may have first communicated the word to you? That means if he falls away, you fall away. Now, now that's why I wrote that particular article in, in the bulletin, if you take the time to read it, God's sovereign work of salvation, because in John eleven fifty two, 52, where it says that he should gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad, those are the very words of Caiaphas, the high priest, an enemy of Christ. Caiaphas, as far as I know, never believed on him died in unbelief, and yet you read that particular report, not just that, but verses previous and after, what God caused him to say, it is of great comfort to me as a believer, even though he didn't enter into it. He didn't enter into it. We dare not, dare not, dare not, ever, ever, ever put confidence in the messenger and the man, because if you do, you're going to fall prey to having to line yourself continually up with men who ultimately may or may not be the Lord's. Now we have to look to the word. We have to look to this word. But there's another reason, I believe, why the word is vital here in verse six. And that is because the subject and content of, of not only the book of Revelation, but of all prophecy has already been set in motion. I can't impress upon us enough the urgency of what we're hearing. We get lackadaisical, I do, we come and go, we think about the week ahead. Does this word just drone in and out of our ears or is there some urgency about what we're hearing? Look at what it says here. It says in verse six, the things which must shortly be done. Shortly. You know, life is a vapor. <laughs> I remember back when I was a teen, thinking it was gonna take forever to get to be 20. And then when I was 20, I wanted to be 30 because I felt like at 30, people respected you a little more. You know, they always kind of still patted you on the back and said, you're, you're wise beyond years, but you're still young, young man. And then when I hit 30, it just, all of a sudden you think, how am I gonna put the brakes on? <laughs> Time's going by too fast. And that's the way it is. It's just now you've got your kids all grown and all calling you pops. <laughs> pops. Old man. 
you know, in your mind and your spirit, you're thinking, I'm not that old. <laughs> but years go by. Things that must be shortly done. You know, if anyone thinks that there's still plenty of time, because that's how people reason. I know young people do. They think, oh, there's still plenty of time to, to believe this. My own children have told me that. It's not that I don't believe it, Dad, but, you know, <laughs> got to live my life. Things which must shortly be done. This determines how long we have. That's of the Lord. Determined by him. And if anyone thinks that there's plenty of time, know that we are in the final hour of God's prophetic clock and have been ever since Christ came the first time. If you think of it in those terms, time is short. If you look in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Isn't that how this book began? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. Notice servants. So this is not just John, but any who stand and preach the gospel. Look at things which must shortly come to pass. Now, if it was shortly to come to pass when it was revealed to John, it's not getting any longer for us several thousand years later. Shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. If you look over in Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 26, Hebrews 9 and verse 26, Pay attention to the language of Scripture. You know, when I was preaching through Revelation, I hope that's one thing that you came away with. It. This is not something we're still waiting for the unfolding of. These are things that are going on right now. The seals have been broken. The trumpets have sounded. The warnings, all of these things in God's providence have taken place. The hour is nigh. As we read here in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26, for then, it's talking about Christ's one sacrifice, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, look at here, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's how the scripture describes, you know, when people ask you, are these the last days? Yes. <laughs> They've been the last days ever since Christ came and put away sin. So we don't have to guess. We don't have to wonder. And certainly John, even if you look in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, he uses even a more precise word to show us how close it is, these things. 1 John chapter 2 in verse 18 Little children, it is the last time, so not even last days, but the last time, and that word in the original is actually the last hour. So we are in the 11th hour of the unfolding of God's will and purpose in history, the last hour. And when did it begin? Well, when Christ came the first time. So I don't have to look to Israel. I don't have to look what's going on in the Mideast to try to figure out, are we in the last days? Yeah, it's, it's been since Christ came. As ye have heard that an Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time or the last hour. All right, so that adds importance, I believe, to what we're reading and studying here. In fact, Verse 10 of Revelation 22 reinforces that, where the angel says to John, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. You know, if you had a book laying open, I don't know how you read books. If I'm reading a book and I intend to come right back to it, I just leave it laying open right there by the chair. And when I come back and sit down, I don't have to go leafing through, I just pick up where I left off. If I have any intention of just leaving it for a while, I 
I'll close it and I'll set it aside. And that's the sense that I seal not the sayings of this prophecy of this book. Let's don't close this thing up as if this is sometime in the far future. No, the time is at hand. You see, the angel tells John not to seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. In other words, the unfolding of the events is imminent. And that's why I believe as we read this book of Revelation and what came from the throne be described as what every period since Christ came the first time has lived and can expect to live until Christ comes again with his judgments and his sovereign hand. And so imminent is this that there follows that very serious warning that we read in verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And for a matter of fact, an unjust person or an unjustified person will live and die in that state. To me, this is the greatest testimony of the work of Christ for a sinner versus one that God has passed by. Because unless Christ is your advocate, unless Christ is your sacrifice, unless Christ is the one who has put away your sin, and unless you are righteous in that imputed righteousness, which was accounted to all of God's people at one time in his death at Calvary, nothing is going to change that. Your endeavors, your attempts, your, all of your striving, it's just, it's a matter of fact. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. I know a lot of preachers that are in contradiction to what we read here. <laughs> they would say, no, 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 don't say that. These are the words of Christ. It's a matter of telling people that there's no hope apart from his person and his work. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. There's nothing that's going to shake a sinner out of God's hands. No matter how strong the world or sin or Satan might be against him. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. He will be. He will be. But here in this final chapter, in these final verses, I believe there's a main message that we see here just by the fact that the words of Christ are repeated three times. I don't know if you noticed it when I was reading it, but it's the words, Behold, I come quickly. And that's really the, the title of this message. Behold, I come quickly. You see it in verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. We see it again in verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And then again in verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. So that's really where I want to wrap up this chapter, this book, with this thought. Behold, I come quickly. In verse 7, you can see every one of these. Behold, I come quickly. has with it a either a blessing or a warning. Now to some who are unbelievers, when they hear, behold, I come quickly, obviously they're not happy. And so in that case, there is a warning. There is a warning. The whole notion of Christ coming again and putting an end to this world as we know it to many is not a pleasant thought because their whole mindset is building in this world and not wanting an interruption. They would like to believe that they have a free will to determine these things, but they don't. This world is God's, has been from the beginning. All of history is his to determine as he will. And even the end is determined by God himself. But you see here in verse 7, particularly these words are addressed to those who are the Lord's, 
Are you the Lord's? Has he by his spirit drawn you to Christ and caused you to see all of your salvation in him, in him alone? Has he caused you to cry out to him for forgiveness of sins and to rest in his finished work alone? Well, if so, then this word, behold, I come quickly, is not going to be something that you're going to shirk back from or fear or somehow fire otherwise. You notice he says, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. If you've got a loved one that's away and he, that loved one writes you and says, I'm going to be home soon. That's good news. That's good news. I think of a soldier over in Iraq and uh, writing his family saying, be home soon. That's good news. That to any that love him and that he loves, couldn't hear better words. Be home soon. Blessed, happy is what that word means. It reminds us of our Lord's Sermon on the Mount. Where is true blessedness? but in Christ. Where is true blessedness but being completely emptied of self and to be filled with Christ? Where, where is true blessedness but to hunger and thirst after righteousness? His righteousness, not mine, his. Oh, to see the righteous one. And you see here, he says, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings. It's not keeping in the sense of gaining or sustaining of salvation. That's by God's grace alone, through Christ's shed blood, but rather to keep. It's like a keepsake. I've given you something in memory of me. Now you keep that. And that's a cherished item. That's what the Lord is saying here. What do we have right now to comfort us? and to keep us, and to hold us, and to cause us to continue to look to Christ other than his precious word. But that's everything. That's everything. I value the, the simple reading of the word. I can't tell you how many times just sitting and listening to the word read here before I have to stand up and preach has been a strengthening and comfort to my own soul. I need it. I need it. It's an oasis in the desert to read these things with observation, to take notice of how they've been accomplished according to God's purpose and will, and to keep them in mind and in memory. That's the blessing. That's the happiness. <laughs> you know, that's the one thing I've prayed. If I should, the Lord should be pleased to take me with a debilitating disease and not suddenly that somehow my mind, as long as he gives me a mind, would be focused on Christ and not on the circumstances, not on the whys and the wherefores that this flesh goes through, but Christ, Christ. Christ. Blessed are those who, at peace are those whose minds are stayed on thee. That's, I believe, what is being described here and through the grace of God even now to steer my life and my conversation according to the instructions and the directions and the cautions that are given here we're all children you know you think well when you're children that's when you need these things we're always children you know in fact the scriptures say if we don't become as little children and be converted we're not enter into the kingdom of heaven I'm always a child. I'm always in need of instruction, always in need of my father's loving chastening to direct me and keep me in the way. And I believe that's the sense here. Blessed in life and blessed in death are those that are the Lord's in this way for our own peace and comfort. All right? And then verses 12 through 19. The second statement with regard to behold, I come quickly. You see that? My reward is 
with me. You ever stop and think what Christ's reward is? That word literally means the just payment for a work done. So if you think of this being the words of Christ, what's the just payment for his work done but his people? Behold, I and the children whom thou hast given me. So when he comes, my reward is with me. Who is his reward but every sinner for whom he has died? That's his reward. He'll not lose one. <laughs> this whole notion of a Christ who suffered and died, and yet somehow some have slipped through his fingers. Some fell through the cracks. Some are in hell for whom he died. It could never be said, my reward is with me. You know, if you get shortchanged at work, for you worked overtime, and you get, you get that check, and all of a sudden, whoa, wait a minute, someone didn't calculate right. When those doors open the next day, you're in the accountant's office. I need to have this thing corrected because I'm, I'm not getting everything that's coming to me. That's the way we are. When you think about it in terms of Christ and his work and what he came to accomplish, when he says, behold, I come quickly, in the end, no matter what the circumstances have been through history, no matter where long ago those bodies have decayed and disappeared, maybe blown up in an explosion. All, it doesn't matter. He's going to have his reward with him. the resurrection. All, everyone is going to be accounted for for whom Christ died. That's a great comfort. And to give every man according as his work shall be. Now again, some people read this in terms of condemnation, but the context is encouragement to the Lord's people. And so to give every man according as his work shall be, it's not as man's work shall be, but as, as Christ's work shall be. Give according to it. In other words, everything that God has ever promised, because Christ has earned it and it has been his reward, it shall be. It shall be. I believe that's the sense in which we need to read this. And the reason is, again, as you read on, it's describing his person. He's faithful. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments. The whole focus here is upon the Lord's people. The Lord's people. Blessed are they that do his commandments. You might say, well, what did doing his commandments have to do with me keeping my salvation? That's not the sense in which it's given. When it says that they may have right to the tree of life. Notice these commandments that are mentioned here. It's not taking us back to the law. Christ fulfilled it. But what are his commandments? Look to him. What are his commandments? Believe on him. This is the commandment that we've received of God, that we believe on his son. There is not going to be any who have trusted in, rested in, believed on by God's grace, Christ and his work, who are going to be ashamed, who are going to be appointed. They have right to the tree of life. Why? Because of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. I like the way that's put, that they may have right to the tree of life. None has right to the tree of life who endeavors to come in any other way but through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. That's, that's his commandment. When friends come along and say, well, why do you put such emphasis upon Christ and him crucified? Because that's God's commandment. That's where I look, to him alone. Yeah, but, no, plug your ears. <laughs> Christ and him crucified. Hang, like I've told you before, when you're resting, hang that do not disturb sign on the outside of the door. <laughs> we don't even want the May clean the room, disturb it. You know, it's, it's Christ and him crucified. That's where the blessing is. And may enter in through the gates into the city. I like the way that's put. That's a, a come in and out and find pasture. That's what Christ has earned by his merits for those who, whom he has redeemed. Who's going to be without 
Well, verse 15 is pretty clear. Dogs, again, this is strong language, but you remember Paul used it. He, he called dogs those that were of the circumcision because it's talking about ravenous dogs, like wild dogs that if given any opportunity are just going to eat away at the gospel and at the Lord's people. Sorcerers, again, a strong word, but who's a sorcerer but one who's blinded by Satan so that they don't see the excellency of the glory of Christ. Whoremonger, those are ones who run after other lovers. They run after other ceremonies, other traditions, other than Christ alone. Murderers, speaking of pastors and leaders of congregations who continue to assassinate men's souls by not pointing them to Christ. Idolaters, that's what every man is. I don't care how religious he looks. Who does not have Christ is all. And whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I'll tell you, there's things worse than lying to men. It's lying on God. Lying on God. And that's what we see here is described by the Lord himself being outside, having no part or parcel with those that are truly his. And he says this, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. What he's saying is I'm the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophecies, everything that's ever been set forth. If you have any doubt, he's speaking here from heaven, having come, lived, died, and risen again. And he's seated on the throne. He's saying I am that root. I, that's why I like to go back and read the Old Testament. Read those promises and pictures and types. They all pertain to Christ. How many sons are there in our universe? Well, we've got one. How many bright and morning stars are there? One. That's Christ. That's Christ. And so we see here in verse 17 where the spirit and the bride say come. You see who this is addressing here? When the Lord says, Behold, I come quickly, for those who are the Lord's, there's a oneness of mind with the Spirit in crying out, Yes, come. Come, Lord. And I believe that's why the Lord brings us through troubles and difficulties in this life. It weans us <laughs> from wanting to put our roots down too deeply. I, I believe there's even a pattern in growing old with all the creaks and the groans. Eventually you get to where... Lord, relieve me of this. I'm ready. Come. Come quickly. He has to wean us from, from any confidence in this flesh. But I believe it takes the Spirit. You see in verse 17, the Spirit and the bride say come. And let him that heareth come. And let him that is a thirst. Where does coming come from? Where does hearing come from? Where does thirst come from? But life. Where there's been life, there's coming. Where there's been life, there's hearing. Where there's been life given, there's thirst. How long can you go without drinking water? There's a thirst. And whosoever will. See, people jump on that. They say, well, see, it says whosoever will. Yeah, but where does the will come from? But Christ himself. Let him take of the water of life. Be careful, freely. If you think there's anything in you or anything conditioned upon something you do, you've missed it. It's freely, freely. Then there's a warning there in verses 18 and 19. If any endeavor to come in any other way by adding to or taking from the words of this prophecy. Notice the prophecy of this book. That word book is Biblios, Bible. So it's not just pertaining to revelation but the whole of God's word don't ever try to add to it don't ever try to take from it you do that whenever you try to make your salvation or your acceptance with God based on anything other than Christ and him crucified you're adding to or you're taking from you see that's the warning 
And God, it says here, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. That is any part he thought to have. Because you talk to most people, they all believe that heaven's theirs. But how sad it'll be for many to discover they didn't know heaven because they didn't know him whom heaven is, which is Christ, you see. And from the things which are written in this book. A lot of people claiming the promises. Name it, claim it. Religion. <laughs> but it's all a fading nightmare. And then the last verse, 20 and 21. For surely I come quickly. Surely. That's what's added to it. I come quickly. And you notice the only comment to that is amen. That word, that word means so be it. <laughs> so be it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And then again, amen. That's how it is. It's by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ alone. Amen.